Hi, I'm Jeffrey Botkin. Uh, some of you have been uh, wanting to know what kinds of questions I'm getting by email. And I wanted to show you, I'm going to go through 20 questions really quickly today, just give you a sample of it and try to answer a few of them very quickly and, and uh, table the ones and file the ones away that I can't really get into. But I want you to know basically what kinds of things people are asking, how they're thinking. I love it that the viewers are thinking in the ways that they are. It's, it's encouraging to me. I want it to be encouraging to you. There are people thinking in ways they've never thought and they're being responsible, they're being humble, they're being constructive. And so, and I want you to be too. Anything that you're thinking about, please feel free to write to me if you have questions. I can't promise that I can answer every question personally, but the ones that I can do on videos like this one, I will try to do down the road. I get questions on, uh, mostly on uh, fatherhood. And I really love uh, talking about that. I, as many of you know from looking at other videos, I, I'm married. I have seven children. I have five sons and two daughters. I have probably the chief investment that I have made in my life has been into my family, and my number one investment. And I'm I'm very thankful that I did that. I, you know, if if I have any regrets, like many of you may have, I regret not having invested even more in my family. But the things that I have done and the things that I have learned now as an, as an, as an older man, a grandfather, 10 grandchildren and, and uh, more on the way, I, uh, I want to share with you, you know, and this, this is good. If you know other older people, ask them what they've learned in life. I mean, we have a lot of catching up to do and things that we missed in the 20th century and the early 21st century that others learned in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. We, so many things have been lost, but many of those things are being regained now at this point. I get questions on uh, practical family living. Uh, relocation and safety is another big one that I get. Now, I, I don't want this channel to be known for that, but I will try to answer basic uh, principial questions about some of those things you think about because so many people are thinking about with their families, with their children, with their future wife and children. What do I do to protect them? I have duties and responsibilities to protect them. I've got to get them away from some of these dangerous cities as we saw in the 20, 2020. Things got really bad in a lot of the blue states and a lot of the blue cities. What do I need to do? Uh, many, as you know, many families have simply packed up and moved. Many families are just simply looking online, buying real estate properties in the country and buying what's in the country because it's in the country. Now, that's not you know, the smartest thing to do, but people are desperate. They want to get out of the urban area into the rural area and they simply pull the trigger and just find a place and go there. Now, I'm thankful that they're making decisive moves like that, but there are principles that may make your move smarter and we can talk about those things. Uh, there were a lot of questions in 2020, let me just say this too, about um, news sources and commentary sources like, for example, Q and QAnon. And for years, I, I just want to say this, evaluate carefully. I advised people for a very long time, for years, to stay away from Q. It was, it, it was too questionable what was going on there. The narratives that were being uh, created were so similar to PSYOP operations of the past. And I, I, I haven't said definitively that that's definitely what it was, but it was so similar. Like, for example, to the Operation Trust um, operation that happened, organized by the Bolsheviks in 1921, and it ran through 1926. And that's what it was. It basically, they had the same slogan, trust the plan, trust the plan as we kept hearing from Q, just, hey, trust the plan, chill out, and don't, you don't need to do anything because it's totally under control. And in, in, the, in the Soviet uh, state, the Bolsheviks were saying, hey, there's some really loyal patriotic generals, Russian generals, who have everything under control. They're going to stop the Bolsheviks. They're going to get rid of them. We'll be able to go back to the system we had before communism. So just trust the plan. And that's, that's what they did then. And what has happened now, I think it will become much more clear in the next year or two who was behind Q and what was going on. But it did neutralize many American patriots, just as it did many Russian patriots in the 1920s, 100 years ago. So do be careful. 
Question number one. Let's, let's rush through these. Do you trust Simon Parks? Okay. He's a vlogger from the United Kingdom who gets on and he says he has a lot of personal secret connections to the British intelligence community and he's um, feeding optimistic narratives to people. Uh, short answer, uh, no, I don't trust him. Don't you trust him. Stay away from him. Just completely uh, save your time. Don't, please don't even listen to the guy. Number two, Epic Times seems to be one of the only reliable sources today. Do you agree? And <clears throat> yes, I, I would say that I do now. But again, on some of these questions, please don't just expect me to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down and depend on me to tell you what is. You need to develop the discernment to know what is reliable. And you need to do a lot of your own evaluation. And one, one way you do this is to, if you think of a source like Epic Times is reliable, watch it over time before you make your final conclusion and see if there's consistent credibility. And what I have seen in the months that I, that I have been studying Epic Times, I am really impressed with how careful they are with what they report. They're not looking for the sensationalistic scoop. They want to give good information to help people think through what's happening to them and, and what Americans need to know that we don't know. I appreciated that the organizers of that organization know a lot that we don't know about totalitarian socialism and how it works, how it operates. Having experience in the Far East, in China, and seeing what the Chinese Communist Party does, seeing what the People's Liberation Army has done, how they operate. And many of those things are directly pertinent to what's happening to us right now in 2021. So I would say, yeah, get a subscription to that, that uh, organ. If you haven't, Epoch Times, I think they pronounce it Epoch Times, E-P-O-C-H. Go there and study it. But again, uh, if it's super reliable now, could it be compromised in two weeks and not be as reliable? You have to keep your antenna up very carefully and keep your discernment turned on with any of these things. Number three, what do you think about social commentary on Doomcock? <laughs> no comment, okay? I have absolutely not enough knowledge to say anything credible or uh, definitive about that. Not, that's where I'll leave it. Number four, <clears throat> is America under divine judgment, meaning a judgment from God Almighty? And the, the short answer to that is yes, of course. Now, the, what, what the Bible teaches is that every nation is always under judgment, either to be rewarded by God for what they're doing and their attitudes of rever reverence or chastened by God for forgetting all about him. Do you remember what Solzhenitsyn said about the nation of Russia? He said, why, why are we being punished? Why are we being destroyed? Why are we being enslaved by the, by the Soviets? He said it was, it was because we forgot God. That's, and he was correct. And that's what was happening. And so the specific judgments of chastisement and punishment that fell on that country were actually talked about in Scripture. And he could see that, he could read that, and so could other uh, you know, careful observers and realize, you know, this is not just coincidence. It, it really is by the intervention of the one who creates nations, who sets up one and pulls down another. And so we really do have to be honest about this and say, yeah, America is under that. Now, I will be doing more videos to describe how this works and what's going on um, later. But we, ha we have to be getting our answers on questions like these from Scripture. People will say, well, no, God would, never, God would never punish any person or any nation because His character is in such a way that, and then they, they redefine who God is based on who they are. And that's a very dangerous thing to do. We have, we have to understand Him and ourselves based on what He says about us. He's the Creator. We're not. Number five, what do I do if my son is aimless? Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what age the son is at this point, but it, it, at any age, there are things we can be doing for our sons to help give them a vision for life, help give them the character they need to, to accomplish what their vision might be. And I, I won't get into this right now, but I am planning a series on things that parents can do for sons from their first year of life all the way up to the 21st year of life. And, and every, every, every single year of life is a different chapter in some of the things that I, I will say. And, 
And we can't wait until our sons are just about ready to leave home to give them purpose and direction in life. It has to begin at, a, at, at really early young ages, the inspiration and the training and the equipment that we give them, what I like to call the weaponry for life. That's what they need. And they need to you know, be able to hold that weaponry. And what I'm talking mainly about is character. They need to hold it. They, know, they need to know what it is. They need to know how to manage themselves and govern themselves. So by the time that they're 12, 13, 14, these things are familiar to them. They can look at themselves and they know where they're weak and know where they stumble and where they fall, where they're frail, where, where they can be tempted, where they can be pushed off course by peers and become followers instead of leaders. And so I want this son here to be a leader and not a follower. I want my sons to be leaders and not followers. And, and you know, and, and by the grace of God, my, my sons are. And I'm very thankful for that. And I want them to, to excel still more with every passing year. Number six, what were some of the most valuable lessons you taught your children? Okay, and again, I will, as I go through this series uh, called Weaponry for Life, year by year by year, what we can train, teach our children, our, our sons and our daughters, um, I'll get into some of that. And so many of you know that to accomplish a lot of the things that we did with our children, we never did put them in the school system. And, and you know that from previous videos. And so uh, let me just say this, though. Um, what were some of the most valuable lessons? Well, they did pretty well academically, mainly because we, were, we taught them to read and then we gave them the character that they needed to be able to study hard, to have curious minds, to chase down the things that they were interested in by doing good, responsible research and that they could teach themselves anything. That's one of the, the main things we taught them. So they were able to just, you know, at their own speed. They weren't slowed down by a government school curriculum and peers who are not going anywhere. They basically could start doing college level work at age 10, 11, 12, 13, if they were capable of it. And so um, they did well academically in that sense. But academics was not the primary thing. It wasn't the priority for us. What we concentrated on a whole lot more with them, and I think this is one of the most important things we did for them, was to teach, their, teach them character work on their character. When we could see uh, vices in her life, like uh, laziness or pride, uh, we would work on that. And, and we would say, you know, and if, if they really achieved and overachieved and outstripped their peers and things that they were doing, we could say, don't get proud, don't get cocky. Um, you need to be humble. If, if you have anything that you have done well, you need to be grateful to the one who created you and gave you these opportunities. And so we, we would direct their attention to, to God Almighty, uh, to their Savior Jesus Christ, you know, pointing out to them that that, um, that is their primary duty. They are required to be reverent and, and bow the knee to Him first. And so uh, these, are, these are things we did. I, I, I guess I would then say that probably the most important thing we, we said to them growing up is that, hey, look, let us give you some some context of where you are in history. You're important in history. Look at all that came before you and, what's, and imagine what's coming after you. And you need to remember where you are right now is in a really crooked and perverse generation. Most of your peers have been taught and will continue to be taught. There is no God. God is a myth. Christianity caused all the evil there was in the world. These are things that they hear and know and what we're telling you as your parents is that's, that's a false narrative. God does exist. He really means what he says. Now, here's a Bible. Let's find out what he says. Because it's really clear and it's, he, he wants it to be clear. He made it to be clear. He revealed it to us as to be clear. That's probably the most important thing that we taught them. But keep your eye on uh, announcements that I make about other, other videos that will be done about the training of children imparting the tools to children and the weaponry to children that they will need to live in a really dangerous century. We want our children to be dangerous to the bad ideas. Right? We, don't want, we don't want them to be passive. We don't want them to be docile. We want them to be leaders and not followers. We want to train them to be able to be able to stand up and lead. 
And so we have to give them those tools and weapons to be able to do that. Number, number seven, this writer says, I have a really super attractive daughter. She's 14. How do I handle the dating, boyfriend, courtship, marriage thing? Again, I may cover, well, I will cover some of those things in, in talking about children as, as they, they reach puberty, as they, as they uh, deal with their peers, interact with their peers. Um, and so I won't really get into that now. But those are the kinds of things that I, I, you know, viewers are wondering about. They want to get it right. You know, they've seen what happened to them or their peers when they were 14 and 15 and 16 years old. Train wrecks with relationships train wrecks with marriages that were contracted in really foolish ways and they don't want that to happen to their children that they love so yeah there are things that we can do to insulate our children from their own errors that they might make and help train them to make good decisions take good steps number eight how can i tell when a conspiracy theory is just a theory okay so real quickly on conspiracy theories now there are conspiracies everywhere. I mean, good guys make them, bad guys make them. It's, ma it's mainly what the word means is that you're, we're breathing the same thing together. If you have some colleagues and you're breathing the same thing together, the same air, the same ideas, the same plans, well, that's just, that's a conspiracy. There's nothing inherently evil about a conspiracy unless it's an evil conspiracy to do evil and to accomplish evil. And so, yeah, there are a lot of conspiracies out there, but many things that are not conspiracies are just horrible rumors that can really take up a lot of your time and make you anxious and make you worry and take effectiveness and joy out of your life. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to those rumors. Now, if there's something that really is, is going to affect you directly, uh, like, for example, the, um, the vaccine, I mean, there's so many rumors out there. That, that it is a conspiracy to sterilize you and your children if you're forced to take it, that you will be forced to take it, that it could actually cause, cause you to die after six years after you take it to accomplish a genocidal agenda uh, that the people want to have who've designed it, you know, because they don't like the population of the world being so high and they want to take it down whatever way they can and government mandated untested vaccines is a great way to do it. You know, well, um, you need to do your research on something like that. If it's going to affect your family direct, directly, be doing the research on That's one thing you can invest your time studying. Number nine, do you think the ATF might come to my door sometime this year? And that's, that was the extent of the question. Do you think the ATF might come to, to my door sometime this year? Meaning the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is an agency of the DOJ, the Department of Justice, which has been weaponized against Americans and against, especially against gun owners. So the ATF, yes, will probably do whatever the Department of Justice commands, commands them to do. Will, so will they come to your door? Uh, and what, what he means here in his question, he knows what he means, I know what he means. He, he's a law-abiding American citizen. He, he owns guns. He wants to know if they're going to come try to take his guns at his front door. And what can I say? Yes, that is their agenda, to get rid of every gun that's in the hands of every private citizen and every private home. But because there are something like one billion private firearms out there in private homes in America, one billion private firearms, they probably will not be able to come up with any kind of a plan to go to every single door in the United States of America. So in their planning, will they come up with something a little bit more clever? Yeah, I think they might. And I think I, uh, I'll give you a, a sample of what that plan may look like. But back to your question, you know, could they come to your door? Yeah, if you have a neighbor who just sees you out there in the backyard dry firing because ammo is expensive, and you can't shoot in your neighborhood, but you're dry firing and showing your sons how to do it. And they see that and they think it's a really dangerous thing that's happening. They think they have to report you. Well, they do report you. And so then some of these agencies may knock on your door. It may be the local police. It may be the National Guard. It may, it may be the ATF. And so what do you do if that happens? Well, let me give you just a, a few uh, tips on how to respond. 
when you go to the door, <laughs> do not uh, appear to be in any way armed or hostile. And make sure they can see your hands. You know, speak in a very controlled way. Have your phone in your hand and be recording the, the, the exchange that happens at the front door. Yeah, and just say, yes, uh, good day, gentlemen. What can I do to help you? And you're recording all this. And they'll state their purpose. And, and maybe they say, look, we, we've, come, we've received a complaint, an anonymous phone call, that's telling us that your home is a very unsafe place and that you have some very dangerous, deadly assault firearms in your home. Can we please just come in and check around to make sure your family's safe? And the answer, okay, you're, what you need to remember and keep in mind, you are not obligated to speak to them. And the fewer words you speak, the better. If they, if they really want to just continue to interview and find out things, you know, do you have fi firearms in your home? Do you have ammunition in your home? Do you have children in the home? You don't need to answer any of those questions. You can say simply, well, <clears throat> you know, I really need to have my attorney present if I'm going to be answering questions. And you, you don't talk about that. It's not illegal to have children in your home or ammunition or firearms. But, and so you think, well, I have nothing to hide. Let me just talk. Don't talk to them. Be, have an attorney present. Now, if they insist on coming in, then this is what you say. Do you have a warrant to come into my home? And if they say, yeah, I have a warrant, you say, may I please see it? And, you know, before you let them in, into the house, <clears throat> your phone is recording audio and video. You, you record what you can of the, of the warrant. You ask to see their identification. You record that identification also. And if they do have a warrant, they really can push right past you and go into the home at that point. All right. But most of them will not have a warrant and they'll have to go away and they'll have to realize that, hey, you know that you can't really talk to them. So they go away empty handed with nothing because you know you need to have a lawyer. They need to have a warrant. And then you can go to plan B. And I won't talk about plan B right now, but essentially if they come to your door, your mission is to not talk and send them away empty handed. Okay. Now, what's the other thing that might happen to you? Well, if you take a look at what happened in the year 2020, you, you can see and I can see and everybody can see that many businesses were decimated, des destroyed or nearly destroyed. Many people became dependent on government handouts, stimulus checks. And what's going on with that? Will, will there just be one or two or three of those or will they continue to make us dependent? Will more businesses fail? And so if that does continue, I want you to imagine this scenario. You or your buddies who have guns um, are really struggling to get by. And one day a registered letter comes in the mail that says, um, we've done some research on your gun, your gun collection. We know that you own this and this and this and this and this, and it's accurate. We need you to bring uh, these weapons down to our office um, tomorrow by close of business in order to receive your next stimulus check that you're depending on to feed your family. Now, you might think when I mention that, that hey, there's no red-blooded American who's going to turn in his guns for that. But you need to think for a minute. If the fridge is empty, the shelves are empty, and there hasn't been food in the house for a long time, and the wife and the children are, re are, are really going hungry, there will be some men who say, you know what, I've got to feed my family. I, this is a hard decision. But I can get guns elsewhere some other time. They know what I have. How do they know what you have? Well, for many of you men, you've been boasting about it on Instagram and showing how good you are with your weapons, how much ammo you have, you know, what's on your gun. Uh, you've, you've also uh, texted your friends about when you're going out to shoot and what guns you're taking to go out and train with. They can triangulate all this information, and they really do know what you have. And maybe they get it, get it wrong just a little bit, but they certainly do know some of the guns that will be on, the, on that letter. And there will be young men out there who are hurting so badly that they may fail the test. They may turn, turn in their guns in order to keep feeding their families. So wouldn't that be easier if there are a billion guns to, to have the ATF agent simply sitting at his desk, letting you into his office, taking in your guns, giving you your stimulus check, giving you a receipt for the guns, saying good day. 
that's going to be a lot easier for them. Number 10, question number 10. We just had a meeting with some of the local businessmen in town who are concerned about the future of our community and nation. Many of these men's and women's businesses have been decimated or on the verge of collapse because of the government COVID response. There is, is currently a chilling effect on free speech and assembly because the fear of fines or possibility even of arrest, and many are concerned about the possibility of police state soon, police state conditions soon. We are now talking about attempting to persuade the town council to replace our federalized police detachment, which takes orders from the federal government, with a locally controlled police force, which we have just discovered is a legal option available to our town. What other things should we be looking at as a community with very small government? Okay. I get really good intelligent letters like this, people who are trying to stand up and lead in their community. And yes, yeah, so I wrote back, I commended this young man who wrote this letter and told him, yeah, you got, you got to get rid of that federal police detachment. Absolutely. So they're working on doing that. What other things? Uh, just in brief and in short, I just said, hey, look, work on getting and replacing every unreliable and ignorant councilman. I mean, there's so many, so many councilmen who are just in it for either, either a little bit of fame and glory, a little bit of a salary, or in our, in our particular county, there is no salary, but they get a really expensive health plan. And we have some, some very deadbeat councilors who are, they can't govern themselves, they can't govern anyone else, they just want to get a, free, a freebie, sit on the council, make ridiculous decisions uh, that hurt the county, and their general mentality is the best way I can serve my county is to apply for federal grants and get federal money in here that's being confiscated from other taxpayers in other states. That is not a legal way to govern. Reduce or eliminate all free market regulations so that the, the county can flourish without those regulations hindering it. Kill every foolish zoning restriction which again can allow the county to flourish even more. Encourage firing ranges, I've said, because in many counties around the, around the United States, you can't have a firing range. Where are people going to be able to train to be adept and proficient um, with their weapons that they, that they are lawfully allowed to have? <laughs> Create sanctuary conditions for the First, Second and Amendment freedoms and other freedoms. Build up legal ramparts for the Tenth Amendment. Tenth Amendment independence from the federal governments. Try to break free from any federal subsidy. And these are things that every local county should be working on. on this next question is about relocation. I have a question about the pros and cons of moving that I'm struggling to decide on. I'm recently married and live with my wife on the western edge of a large city. Now he tells the city, but I, but I don't uh, reveal many of the details in a, in a lot of these. And if you write to me, and if I use your question on the internet, I will, I, I will protect your privacy as I am just in this question here. I'm self-employed and work remotely via the internet and I'm currently renting in town. Land even a good 40 minutes from the city is very expensive in my area. Not as bad as say California, but a good bit over much of the rest of the country. So, so listen to all these. See if you could answer this question for this young man who's writing. And, and I'll give you a little bit of feedback on how I tried to help him. Okay. Now, you're, you're going to get questions like this, too, from people that you know, your loved ones in other cities, and, and I want you to be able to help them think through these things principally. You may not be able to give them a lot of great details on what to do, but if you can just help them think responsibly through what's going on, that's what we need right now. That's the need of the hour. You can stand up and lead by simply talking to people who have questions like these. It would take me longer to be able to afford a piece of property here than in other places around the country. The other major downside is water. My state is a very productive place to grow food and even pastures can be created with adequate irrigation. Wells are very reliable and give plenty of water. The issue, of course, is, and I'm, he's smart, I'm glad he knows this, the issue is if the government puts limits on the amount of water you are allowed to use, like in California, you're sunk. He's, and he realizes this. You're not free. You're not a free man. You can't have the water on your own property. Now, let me state the cons of leaving. My state might be a harsh climate in some respects, but I've lived here most of my life. 
I'm familiar with basic small-scale farming, both from my parents' gardening and animal endeavors, as well as working on a, a small farm. The main reason I hesitate is my community. Okay, now here's, here's where it gets interesting. My wife and I come from large families and are very close to them, as well as our close-knit church body. And if that, is that a phrase you guys know? Um, what that means, a close-knit church body, it means there's a congregation in a church, a local church, and they don't just come on Sunday and then just uh, leave. They know one another. They're close to one another. They communicate with, they do things together. They're, they're really good close friends. That's what that phrase means. Aside from missing them in our lives, if we moved, it's obvious that when things really fall apart. Now, so many of my letters have this phrase, you know, when things really fall apart, because they, they realize, having looked at the year 2020, and all the things that fell apart, even though they thought there was a reliable, responsible administration in the executive department, things still fell apart. Having our family near would be a great asset, one that I don't want to lightly throw aside. And then he says, and he explains, that they won't move. His church body won't move, his family, his parents, her parents will not move. So my question is, from your limited knowledge of my situation, I so appreciate that phrase. So <laughs> some people just, they shoot a question at me, they expect me to know everything about them and to give them a real clear answer in, in black and white. And I can't do that. Now he knows that I have, a, even with this letter, I have a very limited knowledge of his situation. So he says, would it be wiser to look into moving away from my family and my local community who are very strong, very like-minded people and go someplace where the water cannot be controlled by the state? Or should I try to stay and move out of the city and put roots down and do the best I can where I currently live? So in, in my answer back to him, okay, end of question. In my answer back to him, I tried to, to get, get, get him to think a little bit bigger about transportation if things really begin to fall apart like they did in Texas just this month. And the trucks, the delivery trucks, could not bring food to the grocery stores, could not bring petroleum to the gas stations. Everyone was in trouble. And so I tried to find out from him, how far spread out is this close-knit community of people that you're talking about? If they're farther than walking distance, you really won't be as close to, you know, as close to them as you might be practically, even if you moved 700 miles away. If you can't see each other, visit each other, travel to see each other because you're still so far away, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to try to stay in your state hoping that you can still be friends and drive around as much as you want and still see people. A, a community that will be helpful in a, in a time of crisis will, e will be within walking distance of each other and even be able to be like, remember the settlers <clears throat> from the 17th, 18th, 19th century, they might have farms in good places, but when threats came, they would all run together within an already built stockade to defend, be able to, to defend. And when, when a crisis comes, there will be local American enemies who will be running around as marauders, taking everything that other people have, who were responsible, who worked hard, who put things away, who put things back when they didn't. And what we've learned from other uh, scientists have st actually studied this. How do these marauders operate? You know, what's, what size groups do they move around in? How far do they travel outside? How strong does a perimeter need to be with peaceful people who, who want to protect their families? And uh, there are, I won't get into all those answers right now, but this young man needs to be in a place where there is a perimeter of friends who can be together, who do have some firepower, who do have people who can stand guard, and who do have some watchdogs, and who do have some of these other things which can protect them. And simply being, you know, within 30 or 40 miles of your, of your loved ones and your neighbor, that, that's simply not good enough. You really will not be a community at that point. Uh, you need to be close in a community, and that's why I say to people who want to leave the city, I say, do not, whatever you do, do not try to just go out and be all by yourself in a bunker someplace. It's too dangerous. You, you will not be able to, su to survive, and by the way, Communities need your input. They need your help. They need you to be able to stand up and lead with them in a local community as you build up an economy, 
Build up division of labor there in your community with one another. Build up alternative cur currency systems, alternative currency systems. These are some of the things you can do with other families that are really close together. And they really will be able to band together and resist evil when it comes crashing down on, on the community, the local community. Number 12, <clears throat> I was listening to another podcast which said, Jeffrey Botkin knows where to relocate. Okay, so he's writing to me and saying, okay, where's the best place to go outside of a blue state? End of question. That's all he said. You know, I'm supposed to, okay, let me just say, I really, I hope this isn't all there is to my reputation. The people just say, okay, where do I go? Because every case is different. Every family is different. All the needs are different. I'm not going to give black and white answers to people. I would need to, I would need to know volumes of information to, be, to give a responsible answer. And I hope you respond that way when people give you, because you're thinking about these things. You're watching videos like this one. People will come to see you as being above average knowledgeable in these things, but be careful what you say. Don't just give black and white answers and say, you know, well, the very best place, everybody's talking about Northern Idaho. We all got to go there. Well, it may not be the best place. You know, consider all the different criteria that I give in some of the videos that I have done that you can find on this channel. Water is critical. The community is critical. Your freedom is critical. Your ability to be able to work with people is really critical. Okay. And so, and just, you know, and when it comes down to blue state, red state, remember that a blue state can flip to, to a red state very quickly as we saw happen in Georgia. That can happen. And, uh, and when everything begins to fall apart, even the most evil politicians may be having to just look out for their own survival and will be packing up, leaving the capital, heading out by themselves to their little cabin on the lake where they have water, they have fish, they have firewood, and will be trying to survive on their own and, not, and will not be causing you trouble uh, in a situation like that. Everybody will just simply be trying to stay alive when, when that happens. So. Take all those things into account when you think blue state, red state. Number 13. Uh, wow, this is a really interesting one. How does one find one's center? How does one find one's center? I, I do get a lot of questions about this just in, in terms of um, personal growth, you know, personal humility. Um, how do I understand myself? Uh, what should I be thinking? You know, I, I've, I've been a loser all my life. How should I be thinking about the future? What can I change about my life? And I do want to t talk about a lot of these things because, you know, our society, our government has wanted men to be docile, unthinking, demoralized people who can't think or fight and, and can't be free men or uncomfort being, being uncomfortable with freedom. I want you to be free men who can really be comfortable with freedom and be leaders and know yourself, know your enemy, and know what plans need to be made right now. So here's, here's his question. He says, the Lord recently revealed to me that I have been living my whole life, I'm 24, primarily motivated by a quest for the acceptance and approval of other people. Okay, now, okay, so he says, the Lord revealed to me. I, I don't know exactly what he means. He, I, I think from other things in his letter, he's sitting down, he's just simply getting honest with himself, he's reading his Bible, and he's realizing I'm a phony, and I, I know, now I, I know what it is to be honest with God and honest with myself, and I have not been doing that. And you know, and if you sit down with the Bible, you'll do that. Now, what I don't want you to do, <clears throat> if you want to get answers like this, is to sit around and wait for some audible voice to speak things to you. Don't, that's, not, that's not what you do. I don't want you to be listening to the false prophets on the radio or the television who pretend to know what's just right for you, or they say, hey, I know a 24-year-old um, who has this need, and I'm, I'm going to speak this thing into his... It, that is... Um, that's false. What's ha it, it's a trickery. And don't fall for that stuff. But I think this is a very sincere effort from a sincere young man to really get honest with himself and try to figure out what he needs to do. And he, he wants his orientation to be biblical because apparently he, he is a Christian. Now, he goes on to say this, I didn't even realize that I was on this quest for the acceptance and approval of other people. 
People who know me are surprised to hear this because I've always put a big emphasis on originality. Does that sound familiar in any way? I don't want to follow the herd or jump on bandwagons, but I'm realizing that the whole motivation for that was my perception at a young age that the world admires original thinkers. Perhaps not openly, they may be afraid to admit it, but in fact, they respect those who have the courage to chart their own course. I quickly realized that I was not going to achieve the desired affirmation from my peers by being cool. So I trained myself in this different strategy. Paradoxically, he says, I have not truly been seeking originality itself for the sake of originality, but rather merely chasing the respect I thought would follow that persona. All right, so, he, all right, can you identify with this? I pretended not to care what people thought, just to cover how much I really did care about what others thought. Now I'm hit with the fact that my peers respect the man I pretended to be not the one I truly am. More disturbing yet is the fact I don't even know who I truly am. Okay. It is so good, you know, when, when men come to this realization, you know, that, that they need to be honest. They need to be gen genuine about who they are. And, and honesty is where it begins. And humility is where it begins. He says, I know that a good leader doesn't lead to wherever will gain him the most approval by others, but, but where he believes is is right. Of course, the foundation of my identity needs to be in Christ, but how do I discover the unique style of the structure that is me, which is built or being built on that foundation? Okay, so that he really does want to know who he is and what his purpose in life is and what should, should give him purpose. A man must be true to himself, but how does he establish who that self, that personal brand, that modus operandi is, Okay, now, what, what he's doing, he's, he's falling back into some of the ideas that have been given to him in the United States of America, that that's kind of what, that's kind of what every person has to be. You invent your own identity, you identify, you've got this personality, you've got a modus operandi, you've got a personal brand, everybody has to have that. Well, um, that's one mistake that he can begin to learn to get away from and stop thinking in that way. Now. And then how does he, he train himself to act, not by what he expects to bring the most applause from the world, but by what is consistent with his values? Well, you, and you got to have, you know, you have to have the right values um, to even want, want this. Some promote the process of forming a vision statement or defining their core values. And then he goes on to say, hey, can you please do a video on this? I think a lot of people would be interested in it. And um, yes, I will try to do, do that at some point, just talking about this, but just a few points really quickly. Um, his question was, how does one find one's center? And for a, for someone who's not a Christian, that is really easy. You just become as absolutely, totally selfish as you can be. And self becomes your center. What you want is the only thing that matters. It, this is real easy. And that's, that's how Every child learns to think who doesn't yet know what his duties, responsibilities are, or how to look out for people or care for others. Someone who's going to be a leader and stand up and lead begins to think outside of himself and gives up his life for other people. And that's, and that's the identity that I am advocating in this channel. So if you, now if you're a Christian, um, you have a completely different mentality that, I, that I, I want. I'm going to answer back to this, this young man. If you intend to live as a Christian, you don't even look for your, you don't even look for your center. You don't look for your center. You look for something different. You're looking for ways to follow and obey the commands that Christ gives you in the Bible. And I think he's, st he's starting to do this. And this becomes your life and your death and your identity and your purpose. So it's, it's something totally outside of yourself that becomes who you are. Genuine Christians don't worry about their individual brand because they're totally dead to all that. I mean, it's like, you know, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, when he became a Christian, he had so much going for him in his personal brand identity. He was famous as a Pharisee of Pharisees. And, and what he said was, hey, whatever things were gained to me with all of that uh, cachet that I had, 
All of those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He just gave it all up. He was a totally new person. He walked away from everything that was profitable to him. And that's, that's what a Christian has to do. He empties himself. That's the attitude that Christ had. And that's what Christ says individual Christians had. If they want to be like him, if they want to follow him, follow hard after him, that's what they have to do. They have to die to themselves. In fact, um, just looking at commands and verses that the Lord Jesus himself spoke. I mean, this, this is where we have to go. And very few American churches will even go to these verses, these statements. This is not a Jesus Christ that they really know. But if you been, begin digging in the Bible, you will find, like in, in the book of Luke, chapter 14, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Carry my, his own cross, a means of execution. You're, you're totally dying to yourself. Luke 9, if anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus said, these are, his, these are his words, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily. It's just daily a means of dying to yourself to become something that you never were. So then none of you can be my disciple, Jesus said, who does not give up everything that he has all of his possessions, meaning in me, even, even the, the internal things, the non-material things, your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your intelligence, your mind, you give those things up and you apply them to the mission, the new mission that you have serving other people. So basically what you're doing is you're offering yourself up completely to be a slave, a servant, an ambassador of Christ. And this is so totally different from the way that most Americans are, are taught to think about their center and their own importance. And so I'm crafting a, an, an answer back to this young man that contains some, some of these things. Number 14, any way that you could set up, uh, no, any way I could set up a confidential phone call with you and your sons to talk about what's coming down the pike. This is a letter from another country. Uh, and my answer is, it's yeah, well, I don't know the answer. It's, I mean, it, it's really hard to schedule time with sons who are really busy doing things for other people. And their schedules are really full because they're being really productive. But there is a possibility of doing that, yes. And so if enough people express an in interest to that, and you can do that by writing to me, you know, questions at jeffreybotkin.com. Tell me what your interests are. Tell, you know, like this, this man did. If we have enough interest, I will try to make that happen. A private confidential phone call where we can talk and do question and answer back and forth live um, with, with some of you, a limited number of you. Maybe at first come, first serve, those who, who get in first. But yeah, I'll try to do that. Thank you for asking this question. I mean, you know, ask me anything and I will see what can possibly be done. Number 15. I pray you publicly expose the vaccine program, which is absolute genocide. Okay, that, and that's all it is. Just kind of a, a request, something that he's praying will happen. Well, okay, I have not done any video on the vaccine program or the vaccines or the people who make them or Big Pharma or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've not done that. Now, and I will not do that unless my research is complete and completely credi credible completely footnoted, completely unassailable. And I, I simply have not completed that. I've looked into it a lot and I've done a lot of reading. And I have talked to uh, doctors and scientists who've been able to give me a little bit of information, but even they are not sure what's in these vaccines. So it's very difficult. So this is a rumor that it's genocide. You, you take the vaccine and within a particular period of time, all those who have it will die or maybe 90% will die. You know, that's just, that is a rumor. I don't know this to be true. You know, there is the one also about sterility. You take the vaccine and you'll become sterile within possibly a year. Okay, so I'm not ready to do that yet. I will not do it unless it, it can be a completely unassailable document that I release. But I, but I am continuing to do research and I have developed some contacts with some really good scientists who will give me good information. But again, they're trying to compile their own good information too. 
I got a quick report from one of them uh, just two days ago giving me some new information that he has uncovered about what is in these vaccines and what it means. Number 16, can you help us defeat a Minnesota constitutional amendment about giving children a right to a free public education? And I, I'm racing to the end here. But yeah, I did. I read that. I looked at that. It's, it's totally horrible. It sounds great. Every child should have a right to a free and a quality education. Let's put that in the Constitution. But what that means and what that leads to, listen carefully. It leads to the ability of the left to go to the Constitution and say, now we have to come up with a legislation that allows us to tax all these hardworking Americans, to come up with teacher, a corps of teachers, an army of teachers and change agents that will teach a curriculum that's been designed over here funded by more tax dollars confiscated from good taxpayers to create a compliant population. And we'll call that a good education. And so then it all lands on the child at the same time. We still call it a quality education, a good education, but what we're doing to him, demoralizing him, causing him to be docile, causing him to be compliant, causing him to be politically correct, causing him to be fully woke. And we call that a good education. And it's compulsory because the Constitution says he has a right to, to get all this stuff. And so, yes, let me just say, in, to all you in Minnesota, don't vote for this. Get rid of it. It's, it's not good. And understand what education, public education, has been doing to this country since the 1850s. Before that, there was no compulsory government education. After that, it has been carefully designed not to make students smart or good or virtuous or responsible or patriotic, but just the opposite. And it's been very successful because we swallowed it. We, we went along with it. We went along with the slogans. Number 17, does the Bible say that we have a right of self-defense? Uh, short answer, um, yes. Now you won't be able to look it up and find a phrase that says <clears throat> uh, you have a right to self-defense. In studying uh, what the wisdom that's in the Bible, which is a complete uh, system of systematic theology that's true, there, there are no contradictions in it ever. You can see the wisdom of the Creator, who we are, who men are, what life is, what death is, what ethics are. And, and yes, it can be seen, since Christians have been trying to look and search in the Scriptures for the, a thousand years in the Western Hemisphere, they have all agreed that yes, it's very clear that there is um, not only a right, but a duty of self-defense, and not only a duty of individual self-defense, if you're threatened, if your life is threatened, or your life even feels threatened, but also a nation has a duty and a right to self-defense, to defend itself from an attacker. And so these doctrines were established, they were, they were, they were proven to be true that are in the Scripture. And of course that is, I mean, what he's asking is, you know, does the Bible say, is the highest ethical standard to give us the highest law of the land, since it is the authority, does it say that we can do this? And yeah, and so that's good. He's not saying, hey, doesn't it make good sense that we, we follow a doctrine of self-defense? He's saying, does the Creator who gave us ethics, who established right and wrong, does He say that there's a right of self-defense. Now, if he said there wasn't any right of self-defense, that everybody just needed to be passive and give up in the face of all evil, well, then we would want to follow that. Even, even if we felt like, no, I'm going to resist this evil and live another day. If God said, no, you couldn't do that, well, then I would, I would have to say, well, no, here's what God says we must do, but God does not say be a pacifist and just roll over and let evil triumph. There are doctrines to resist evil. We have to go against it. We, we have to do away with it. We have to be able to look, and, I, and I've trained my sons this. You need to be able to look evil in the eye, take it by the throat, and get rid of it. That's part of being, that is part of being able to stand up and lead in this country. And you have to be able to know where all the evil is and look at it, be able to recognize it, be able to smell it. And so, th yes, this is how we live. And yes, those doctrines are there. Number 18, I'm a vet and a police sergeant. I plan on relocating. Um, I'm excited about what lies ahead. He says, um, how can one be even begin to find places to relocate to? Well, again, please look at some of my earlier videos. There's one on, are you re relocating to Russia? 
There's one uh, called, um, where are you moving to? Or where are you going? Look at that one because that, it gives some criteria on how you sort these things through. Number 19, I'm a single man in my early 60s. Retired, also an Army veteran. I'm very interested in joining a legal militia group. I've written to my local sheriff, state rep, my local state rep, reaching out for help and information regarding all this. Okay, that's good. That's where, where you need to begin. You don't just want to go down the street and find some guys who are meeting together who have guns and ammo and a chip on their shoulder and an angry attitude toward the tyranny that's coming down. Uh, that may be a totally illegal grouping of people and not a real legal militia. There's a difference between the two, and this man wants to be on the right side of the law with a good group of men who are on the right side of the law, and he's trying to follow a path to get there, which is really good. I commend him for that. He says, I don't have the skills or organizational abilities to start up one of these things. I thought if I could get in one that's legal, that will help me, and then maybe I can start another one. Because, yeah, the, the local unorganized militia are really localized, so, so the men can be together, they can train together, on a regular basis, like a weekly basis, in weapon manipulation and communication with each other so that they're useful when they're called on by the legal authority that's above them. In our state, it's the governor and the adjutant general that's as, that, that is right above them. So what most of us have, has, have heard growing up is that the M word, the, the word militia, is a dirty word, it's a pejorative. Nobody should ever be in a militia. We don't need that, that's Minuteman days. Today we have the National Guard, that's all we need, and there should be no guns in private homes. There's no need for that. In fact, that causes trouble, that causes murder, that causes mayhem. And so let's just let the National Guard handle everything. No, this, this man here is being extraordinarily responsible by knowing and understanding that there is still on the books, in the Constitution, in the Militia Act of the, of the early 1900s, and in presidential law, the militia still does exist. It's just not being organized well by men like this who think, who think this way and who will pull themselves together and get hold of their representatives and, their, and the governor who's above them. In our state, it's the governor. And say, okay, we're ready. We're reporting for duty. We're getting together. We're training. Uh, I'm in my early 60s, but look, I'm in I'm pretty good shape. I can still function even though it might say in my state that once you're 59, you're out of the, <laughs> you're out of the militia, okay. Which you know, in many states it does. I forget the the upper age range uh, in our state. I'm way past that. But hey, I I know a lot of men my age who can still run and gun really well that I would be very comfortable standing next to in a serious life and death conflict. And so, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I'll get you some information on this. Uh, number 20, last question: Should I enlist? in the U.S. military. Uh, my answer to this is you had better do your own responsible research thoroughly. Here's where you start. Talk to as many men in the military as you can and ask them this question. Talk to the men who are getting out. Talk to men who've been out for a year or two and ask them honestly, should I get in? And, and the ones that I'm talking to who are in these categories, they're in it now, they've recently gotten out. They are telling young men to stay out at this point, especially with the new Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. Uh, they're very uncomfortable with his appointment and what's going on in the Department of Defense, what's going on in the Executive Department of the United States. And so it's, I know why you want to get in, young men. I, I know absolutely why you want to get in. And your motives are good. As, as patriotic citizens who want to defend our country against threats that you can see and you know are pressing in on us from east and west and from internal and internally also. But you better be very careful. As an enlisted man, don't, I, my advice is don't go in as an enlisted man. If you think you absolutely must get in, go in as an officer. Because in that, if you're an officer, if you're given an illegal order, you can resign your commission and leave. As an enlisted man, the only, the only way out is to resist that order as illegal and be court-martialed and, and get a dishonorable discharge. So it's, it's very risky now. There are many illegal orders being given to the soldiers in the United States military. Some are making the error of following those, and some officers are just flat getting out. Many of the best officers are being fired and pushed out. It's not the military that it was a few years ago. 
And so those are, really quickly, 20 questions. I want you all to continue thinking. I want you to continue staying free. And I want you to continue to think, planning on how you can stand up and lead in your local community. Thank you.